Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. I'm here with a GCSE chemistry exam question walkthrough and today's video is focusing on the periodic table. If you want to have a go at these questions before watching the video, they're available for download in the description. And then when you're watching the video, you'll see me modeling the thinking and the background behind the question in blue. And then the answers that are going to get you all of the marks, they will be written in green. The first part of this question requires you to understand quite a few different aspects of the periodic table, but they don't ask for much from you about each of them. So they're all one mark each, and the majority of them are getting you to pick one of the letters J, L, M, Q and R from the periodic table here that corresponds to the right bit of chemistry knowledge that you should have. So the first question says, which element has four electrons in its outer shell? And the chemistry content that you need to know here is that the group number for an element corresponds exactly with the number of electrons elements have got in their outer shell. So the group one elements have one electron in their outer shell. And so not only do you need to know that, you also need to know to overlook these transition elements for now. And we find group one, group two, group three, group four. So the elements in group four have got four electrons in their outer shell, and so the correct answer is J. And then the question goes on to say, which two elements in the periodic table are in the same period? Now, periods are the rows in the periodic table. They go from side to side. And so we're looking for any of these rows that contain elements in the same period. So M and Q are in the same row, which means that they are in the same period of the periodic table. And I think this group here has got a bit of a, a decoy really, because these are in the same column, but the columns are called groups. And we want the ones going side to side. So M and Q is the correct answer for this. You need both of them for the one mark. Then the question says, which element reacts with potassium to form an ionic compound? Now, first of all, an ionic compound is when a metal joins with a non-metal, and the metals in the periodic table are over here. And potassium is a metal. In fact, potassium is here in the periodic table. It's not one of the letters that is up for grabs. And so the element that we're going to choose has to be a non-metal, so we can choose between J and Q, and it has to be a non-metal that will readily accept electrons in order to fill its outer shell. Now J is in group four of the periodic table, and so it has got four electrons in its outer shell, as we already know, and so to fill its outer shell ionically, it would have to gain four electrons, and that doesn't typically happen. That element, which is actually carbon, will form covalent bonds and it will be Q that will gain electrons because it's in group seven, it only needs to gain one electron to fill its outer shell and that's quite easy to do, far easier than gaining four. So the correct answer is Q. And then the question moves on to say, which element forms ions with different charges? Now the charges typically correspond to the group of the periodic table. So the elements in group one will typically throw away their one outer shell electron and become plus one ions. Group two forms plus two ions. Group three plus three. Group four, as I've already said, doesn't readily form ions. Group five needs to gain three electrons, so it forms a three minus ion, then two minus, then one minus, and then these elements already have a full outer shell. Those are the noble gases, so they don't lose or gain electrons at all. And that means that we're talking about this middle block of the periodic table then, because these are the only elements with an unpredictable charge because they might lose a particular number of electrons, maybe a two, maybe a three. So for instance, something like iron. Iron can typically be a two plus ion or a three plus ion. And that's actually not this one here. This M stands for manganese and that can go as much as plus seven. But all we need to do here is just tick the M. And last of all, which element has three electron shells? And the number of shells an element has got is the number of periods in the periodic table. So period one is one occupied electron shell. The elements in period two have got two occupied electron shells. Period three has got three occupied electron shells. And so that is L. And so the correct answer here is L 
because the number of electron shells that are occupied is simply the period number in the periodic table that you find that element in. Then the question gets a bit more difficult for the final part. It's an extended response six mark question and it's getting us to look back in time at the development of the periodic table. And this is a really common type of question, particularly because it focuses on Mendeleev as well as Newlands. And so in the 1860s, we're told that there are two scientists trying to organise the elements. We've got Newlands, and his is the top periodic table, and he's got the elements organised in order of their atomic weights, which we now call relative atomic mass. And then we've got Mendeleev in 1869, and his is the second periodic table. And it says here that Mendeleev's periodic table became accepted by other scientists, whereas Newland's table was not. And we've been asked to evaluate Newland's and Mendeleev's periodic tables, including a comparison and reasons why Mendeleev's table was more acceptable. So for evaluate questions, we normally have to make a judgment, but they've actually told us what judgment that we need to make here. And that's that Mendeleev's periodic table is more acceptable. This question is going to be one of those that says level one, you get one or two marks. Level two is three or four marks. Level three is five or six marks. And so obviously I want to teach you how to get the five or six marks. In order to do that, we need to make a judgment about why Mendeleev's was more acceptable. It needs to be strongly linked and supported by lots of different evidence from these two periodic tables, as well as our own knowledge. Now, when we're asked to do a comparison, it's important to compare things that they have in common as well as differences. And the most common thing for people to do is to lunge in with the differences and forget what they have in common. So let's start with the commonality. And let's say that we want to throw in a couple of these in our answer. I'm going to give you far more than six relevant points to make, but I think we should definitely make at least six of these in order to secure our six marks. So first of all, comparison. Both tables have got more than one element in a particular box. So if we take a look here, Newlands has got cobalt and nickel in the same box. And then we've got actually quite a lot of instances where there's two elements in the same box for Newlands. And we have the same thing for Mendeleev's periodic table. So they definitely have something in common, multiple elements in the same box. Moving on to a good thing about both of their periodic tables, they both have got similar elements in the same column, the same group. So they've all got lithium, sodium, potassium in the same sequence and calcium, magnesium and beryllium. So that's a positive thing that they both have in common. And then moving beyond what we've been presented with here, those two points are probably enough for a positive comparison, what they have in common. But if we bring in our own knowledge here, we can recognise that both of these periodic tables have got something missing that we typically expect to find on the right hand side, the noble gases. Both periodic tables are missing the noble gases. And something that we've been given partial information for, Newlands used the atomic weights to organise the elements, Mendeleev did as well. We haven't been told that here, but that's something that they had in common. The modern periodic table, of course, is now organised in order of increasing atomic number. But they didn't have any knowledge of protons or atomic number at this time. So I've listed four comparisons that are the same for both of them. I suggest you aim to go for two to include in your answer. And then we need to be working towards our conclusion. So let's have a look at some advantages of Mendeleev's periodic tables or, or some disadvantages for, for Newlands. And Mendeleev left gaps for undiscovered elements. That is huge. And that is the thing that Mendeleev is probably most famous for whereas Newlands didn't. And so I think this is the sort of occasion where you could get almost two marks for the price of one here. So you can have a, a comparative sentence where you can say Mendeleev left gaps for undiscovered elements, whereas Newlands didn't. And then a follow up point, Mendeleev actually changed the order for some elements. And that's what we find here with tellurium and iodine. If you went exclusively by atomic weights, which is what Newlands did, they should be in the different sequence. Whereas Mendeleev flipped them for the benefit of having similar elements, so iodine, bromine, chlorine and fluorine, all in the same column. Whereas Newlands didn't do that. He had far more overlap between dissimilar elements being in the same column than Mendeleev did. Mendeleev at least had taken some steps to reorder them outside the atomic weight order so they had similar properties to the elements that they ended up in the same group as.
And at this point, I would say that we are at a level two answer. We would be looking for a couple of these points from the top four. That would definitely be putting us in the level one category. And then moving on to the second set of four bullet points, we can definitely access level two with probably just any one of these sort of double sentences. These top two bullet points would allow us to access level two. And so a couple of these bullet points combined with a couple of these bullet points would definitely be looking at four marks. But now we haven't yet made a judgment. And that brings us on finally to why Mendeleev's table was more acceptable. We've hinted at the reasons, but the biggest reason that you must include in any answer of this type is to do with Mendeleev's gaps that he left in the periodic table. And they're marked with these question marks here. Sometimes in questions, they're marked with a star or an asterisk. And so not only did Mendeleev leave gaps, he predicted the properties that these missing elements would have. And then a few years later, when these elements were discovered, which fitted into the gaps, it was found that the predictions that Mendeleev had made were correct because the elements did have the properties that Mendeleev had predicted. And that was such a bold move by Mendeleev to make these predictions. But when he was proven correct, it was really hard to argue against it. And so people accepted Mendeleev's periodic table readily after that point. This means then to get our level three answer, we definitely need to include a couple of bullet points from this final section of four, commenting on the gaps for the predicted elements and the fact that Mendeleev's predictions were correct. Now it's worth pointing out that sometimes any one of these three sections could be a question in its own right, particularly this final section for maybe two or three marks explaining the process that Mendeleev went through. And this is really popular because this is literally the process of the scientific method, making a prediction collecting some evidence and finding out whether that prediction was correct or whether it was false as a prediction. And so Mendeleev really is studied in great detail because of the process of prediction and proof that he is evidence of. Okay, that's the end of this question. That's the end of the video. I hope it was useful. I'll see you again soon.